Hey, uh, this is Brad Stahlberg. I'm a local author. Uh, this is my new book, The Passion Paradox. I'm thrilled to be here at the shop uh, to discuss the book for a little bit with Maddie. So thanks so much, Maddie, for being willing to chat about the book. Of course. Um, well, my first question for you, Brad, was why did you decide to write this book? So the, the genesis of this book, uh, it's a long story and I'll do my best to, to make it shorter, is my co-author, uh, Steve and I, we had just written our first book uh, that's called Peak Performance. And it was the first time either of us had written a book for a major publisher. And we sent in the manuscript and we were expecting to get our edits back uh, at a certain period of time. Steve lives in Houston. So we had scheduled about two weeks to be together prior to getting our edits uh, to go through those, finalize the manuscript. And we got a note from our editor that basically said he was running a little bit behind in his queue, but the book looks great, it's in good shape, there will only be a few minor edits. So instead of celebrating going on vacation for two weeks, Steve and I were happy for about 30 minutes, and then we looked at each other and we said, well, crap, what are we gonna do now? Like, what's next? Uh, and then we stepped back and we said, what's wrong with us? Like, why can't we just be content? Why, why can't we be happy? We just got, got the go-ahead on our first book, uh, and that led us into an investigation of passion. Both of us were always told growing up that we had all this passion, we had this drive, that it was unequivocally a good thing. And we started to wonder, well, is it always a good thing? Wouldn't it be nice if you could just be content yeah. uh, and, and kind of relax a little bit? And what's the science of passion? Is passion, uh, you know, do you, do you actually just find a passion or do you have to cultivate a passion? Um, if you blindly follow a passion, does that always lead to positive outcomes or not? And um, that was the genesis of this book. And, and what we found is that passion is much, much more nuanced than one would think. Um, I grew up in the generation that at every single commencement speech, probably starting in middle school, someone told me to find and follow my passion. Oh yeah, I still hear those. <laughs> yeah, so they're still popular. But no one really says what that means. No one tells you how to do it. Uh, and that was the question that, that I was interested in exploring, and that became this book. Well, now you may be curious. I'm just wondering, <laughs> what is the science of passion? Did you figure that out when writing this book? And also, follow-up question, what is the passion paradox? Yeah, so those are good questions. Uh, so the, the science of passion is fascinating. Um, the, the way that I like to define passion is the relentless pursuit of something that has positive consequences. Um, the most commonly accepted definition of addiction is the relentless pursuit of something despite negative consequences. So it's pretty fascinating that passion and addiction are very close cousins. Uh, and what the research shows is that what's happening in the brain of somebody that is super passionate is very similar as to what's happening in the brain of someone that's suffering from an addiction. Because you get this tunnel vision, this inertia where you're pursuing the thing that you want at all costs. And if the thing that you want is something that society says is productive, then you're told that you have passion and it's this great thing. But if the thing that you want is something that might be more destructive, then you're told that you have an addiction and it's problematic. Um, so I, you know, passion's like jet fuel. And if it's pointed in the right direction, then it can be this really solid energizing force that can lead to all kinds of great things. But if it's pointed at the wrong direction or if it's not controlled, then it can lead people astray. Uh, and that, that's a good segue to your second question. So what's the paradox of passion? And it's just that. Um, there are two major findings on passion. And the first is that really passionate people tend to, tend to have uh, overall life satisfaction. So they're happy, positive health and well-being, and they live a long time. At the same time, passion is also associated with anxiety, depression, and burnout. So the paradox of passion is that it's both this blessing and it's this curse. And sometimes it's the same thing to the same person in the course of a year, a month, even a week. Uh, so then the question becomes, well, how do you control your passion so it doesn't control you? How do you keep it pointed in the right direction? How do you know if you've found something that like, you should be passionate about? Like, how do you know if you've found the right passion? Yeah, so that's, that's another, um, that's a great question. And another one of these areas where there's more nuance than what we're told in these inspirational speeches. So everybody says to find your passion. But the truth is that you don't really find your passion, you have to develop a passion. Uh, and the best way to develop a passion is actually to lower your expectations and not expect to find something that's perfect right away. So my generation, your generation, we're told to find our passion. So what happens is we go out and we look for this activity that is going to make us feel incredible right away. And it's gonna be perfect, smooth sailing. 
and then we probably don't find it because there aren't too many things that are perfect right away. Or we do find something that feels great, but then two, three weeks in, we hit a rut, and then we say, oh, well, this must not be for me, this must not be my passion, so we quit and we move on to the next thing. Um, we get stuck in this mode where we're perpetually seeking. Uh, this is really interesting because the, the, the literature on the kind of passion that we're talking about, so like passion for a job, for a hobby, is very similar to romantic passion, particularly in the age of online dating apps. Lots of young people believe that there's this one and only soulmate for them. So they keep searching until they find this magical person that they feel like is perfect. But much like in this kind of passion, the research on romance shows that if you have that expectation, you actually end up less likely to find someone that 20 years later you think is perfect. Um, so it's a huge misconception. So if I were giving those commencement speeches, I would say at the very least, don't worry about finding your passion, have the patience to develop it, and that starts with following your interests. Um, and it's this very like nuanced tweak in mindset, but simply lowering the bar and not expecting that you're magically gonna find a passion opens up the door to have some patience to pursue things a little bit longer than you might otherwise have, and then those are the things that can become passions. That's so interesting, oh my gosh. Do you have a passion, do you think, or is it writing? Yeah, it's probably writing. Uh, I, I, I tend to be passionate, probably most passionate, about um, writing, and I, I have a 15-month-old now, mm -hmm. so I also love Theo quite a bit. Uh, and then I'm also, I love fitness, so whether it's running, lifting weights, um, but I don't have too many other hobbies. And that's another theme in the book, that the, 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 I would argue that the two most popular self-help phrases are find and follow your passion and then be balanced, right? Like, oh, you need to have a balanced life. Mm -hmm. But if the definition of passion is the relentless pursuit of something, and the most common definition of balance is equal things in equal proportion, make time for everything, those two things are irreconcilable. You cannot be passionate at the same time that you're balanced. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people like me, like do-goody, you know, straight edge type A people, they're like, oh, I've gotta be passionate and I've gotta be balanced. And then you just end up frustrated because you're, you're striving to do these two things that, that, don't, that you can't, they're antithetical to each other. Um, so there's a chapter in the book, it's probably my favorite chapter of it's called The Illusion of Balance. And how if you are passionate about something, then you shouldn't necessarily worry about being balanced. Now that's not to say that you should just blindly follow your passion and leave everything else by the wayside, but you can give yourself permission to go all in for periods of time, mm -hmm. so long as you maintain, and this is really important, the self-awareness to uh, objectively evaluate what you're giving up as a result. Um, but another really interesting thing, of all the very passionate high performers that we interviewed for the book, if you look at them at any one point of their life, they're pretty horribly unbalanced. But if you look at them over the course of their whole life, they're actually pretty balanced. So it's like a seasonal approach, where there's a season maybe for going all in on writing, and there might be a season for going all in on family and friendship, and there might be a season for going all in on training for your first marathon, or learning how to cook. Um, but it's a temperament where you struggle to focus on multiple things, you wanna do one thing and do it really well. Mm -hmm. And I personally think that that's totally okay so long as you can, again, evaluate the trade-offs and be willing to shift if and when the time makes sense to shift. I feel like that makes sense too, because if you want to be really good at something, you got to put in a lot of time and you can't be diverting your attention to a lot of other things. Is that kind of like the idea? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that with passion, with passion comes talent. Um, mm -hmm. And the more that you enjoy doing something, the better you'll be because the more that you like it. Um, but totally. But again, I want to be like, it's this very, um, it's like, it's funny, the title is Paradox. I think that all truth is paradox. There's definitely a paradox there too, because one of the ways that passion goes awry is when the momentum and the inertia of the thing that you love gets so, so strong that you can no longer see outside of it. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like you lose the ability to even consider other things in your life because you're so focused on this thing. Uh, the example that we use in the book is it's very much like the, the emotions that an entrepreneur mm -hmm. or an athlete training for the Olympic, oh, yeah. they, might, that. Yeah, they <laughs> might be feeling. It's very similar to someone falling in love for the first time. So the only thing that they can think about is their company or is making the Olympic team. And you get these blinders, which for a period of time can be really helpful. But if you end up tying your entire identity and your entire self-worth to that one pursuit, well, if it doesn't work out, 
that's the dark side of passion where it becomes associated with more negative things. What do you think are the major takeaways from this book? So I think that there are there are three or four major takeaways, um, and they're all they they are all very much what I think are these paradoxes. So the first is that you don't actually find your passion, and the number one thing that will get in the way of developing passion, whether you're young, old, male, female, it doesn't matter, is to expect to find a passion, because again, then you're going to be looking for this perfect thing, and you're not going to give things time to actually emerge. Uh, I think the second paradox is that you should never follow a passion. You should let your passion follow you. And what I mean by that is if you get swept up in that inertia and you just take it wherever it takes you, it might take you down a rabbit hole that is not good for you. So you want to be in control of your passion, not the other way around. Uh, the third big takeaway is this notion of if you feel like you have a passionate temperament, you're someone that really likes to give your all to things, forget about trying to be balanced. Like, don't feel bad about it either. Just make sure that you're evaluating the trade-offs in your life. And then I think the fourth takeaway is around transitioning from passion. And how if you, there's a poet that I love, his name's David White, and he says that the things that you care most about are the things that break your heart. And I think that's really true with passion because the more that you care about something and the more of yourself that you give to it, when the time comes to transition from it, the harder that will be. And I think that a lot of people, um, they don't necessarily consider that and we don't do a good job supporting people when they're transitioning from passions, whether that's out of a vocation that they loved or even parents that have their kids go off to college. That's a really hard transition. Um, and I think that we could bring a lot more attention to those periods of transition. And if you are someone that is approaching a transition, just the importance of surrounding yourself with community and other people who get it, who have made similar transitions, can be so, so helpful as supports. I feel like you should give this talk to like all the senior parents in my grade right now. They're all really <laughs> nervous. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's a thing and it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was also wondering, what is your favorite part of the book? Is it the chapter you mentioned or? Yeah, so I, it's probably the, the section on the illusion of balance. Um, because that, that was something that for me, I always felt that when people told me to be balanced, I wanted to ask why. And no one really ever gave me a good answer. And um, really diving into the research and then the stories of some individuals that have been hugely successful in following a passion, again, what you find is that these people are not at all balanced. Uh, and then I did this really interesting thing where I just started asking random people to tell me about the times that they felt happiest in their lives. No one told me, no one described times when they were completely balanced. People said, I was raising my first child. Uh, I, was, I was all in on starting my medical practice. I was training for my first triathlon. I was opening the bookstore that I dreamed of opening. These are times when you're not asleep, like you are, you are not balanced, but those are the times that really make you tick. Um, so I've kind of come out as, as an evangelist against balance. Now, there's values neutral. If you feel like you are a very balanced person and that works for you, that's great. But if you have this wiring where you tend to be passionate about things, I think that balance is just a burden that is really helpful to release from. Um, let's see. And then my final question, I think, is, is it possible to have multiple passions? Like, or is that kind of like contradicting like the main purpose of a passion? No, I think it's totally possible. And I'm glad that you asked that question. Um, something else that emerged in the research and reporting on the book is that passion isn't necessarily and, and shouldn't necessarily be just for a specific activity. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's much more of a temperament. And I'm a science nerd, so I'll spare the audience the science. Um, but here I go going into the science. There's this neurochemical called dopamine, which is very much associated with striving and with the chase of something. And there are individuals that um, have a genetic insensitivity to dopamine. So that means they need more of it to feel good. And those are individuals that are predisposed to have this passionate personality. If you can't feel good, you're not content, you keep striving, you keep pushing for the next thing. And if you have that kind of personality, I actually strongly recommend having multiple passions because that's what kind of keeps you from getting your identity too fused with any one thing. That makes sense. Well, thank you so much. I really, um, I feel like this book is so amazing and I really wanna buy it, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for the wonderful interview. I appreciate it. Um, and thanks to everyone out there. Um, I hope you learned something and, and read the book.